the cure for shyness is to know that that feeling you have, that you wish someone would come over and make you feel at home at the party, you have to go give that feeling to somebody else because there are other versions of you standing around right now, although they may have brave or good poker faces, there are people like you standing around wishing that someone would come and make them feel at home in this place. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm very happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you for being on here. Happy is, to be here. And I, I'll do a whole other intro proper like, later. But by the way, do you consider, are you, are you called, like, do you call yourself a relationship coach? What's the pro life coach? What's your title? I don't know anymore. I, I guess dating and relationship coach or dating, co I, I don't even know. I could, because it's so, it's become yeah. really expansive what we do. I mean, you know, I... I've spent 15 years now predominantly helping women find love, keep love, right. build their confidence, and create a life where love is no longer necessary as a precursor to their happiness. And that's, that's really been my, my mission. I, you know, I've, I've worked with people at so many different stages of their love lives. And, and my fundamental kind of tenet is that you can't have a great love life without having a great love for life. Mm. The, the two things have to go hand in hand. And, you know, I, I, so many people struggle in this area. They either struggle yes. because they're looking for love and, and they're struggling to find it, or they've had their heart broken and they're struggling with that, or they're questioning their current situation, or they're struggling with their own mind, their own confidence and you know the demons that this area of their life brings up it's a wonderful way in people's love lives because I, I love talking about everything yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah I never set out to say for the rest of my life the only thing I want to talk about is dating right but I but people uh, you just you you need a way in to all of the things that cause us suffering in life and love is one of those things it's a wonderful way in to people and it's also like the most universal right because everybody wants love wants to feel loved i mean there's nothing more i mean you can talk about money success all you want but at the end of the day if you don't have that it's very you feel very a lot of times you feel very like unfulfilled i would say would be a word to say yeah there was a i, I put up a quote a, a question on my instagram just in the last couple of weeks and I asked people, what's your biggest fear? Mm -hmm. And we had thousands of responses. And the response that had the most likes, it had three and a half thousand likes on this one comment, was a woman who said that I will never find my person. She said, I have an amazing life. I have, if she, was, she almost was like preempting the things that people would say. Right, she right, was like, right. before you start, I have amazing friends. I travel solo. I have an ex a job that I love. I love myself. You know, I all have the all things. the things that you're going to tell me I don't have. Right. And if I'm brutally honest, I still just feel like without romantic love, I my life is incomplete. And that's a what a hard thing to respond to, you know? It is. And I think that's also very honest and true. And I think that a lot of times, especially now, I think in, like I feel like in the in the in the zeitgeist whatever you want to call it people are tr constantly trying to like you know kind of like shy away from saying the truth which is that is the truth I mean mm -hmm. you can you can say oh you know you know slay women slay or you know you know you 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 have it all you don't have to you don't need a man you don't need a whoever whatever whoever you like but at the end of the day every like, every happiness expert every uh, Harvard psychologist, doctorate, anybody I've ever spoken to, at the end of the day, all the research constantly points to the same thing, which is the, what makes people truly happy, satiated, fulfilled, is feeling love and having love in their life. So you can yeah. say all these other things that may sound nice in the hashtag, but at the end of the day, that is why you're popular and that's why people love hearing about these things because at every stage of life you evolve. Like you were saying, you could be dating, but then you could be married and unfulfilled or married and kind of in a, in a different situation. You have different phases of love mm. and to keep love, right? I and, couldn't agree more. Right? And so 
I just think that like we're doing each other a disservice by going out there saying we don't need it, we don't want it, we can, we are all powerful ourselves. Like that's all bullshit to me. That's not true. I think you you use these other things as distractions mm. when you don't have it. Yeah, you're speaking my fiance Audrey's language because yeah? she has been saying this for uh, some time now that the, you know, that it's it's enough. It's one thing to feel sad that you haven't met your right. person. Right. It's another thing when you feel ashamed to feel sad about it. Right. Like there's some, I, not only am I in pain kind of chronically, because it is a kind of chronic pain. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a very fascinated with chronic pain because it's, I've, I've suffered with my own physical chronic pain and it taught me a lot about life and, and uh, acceptance and things you can't just make go away. Totally. And the, there is a kind of emotional chronic pain that comes with wanting to find love and, and not finding it. It follows us. Totally. And the end, you can fill your life with many, many things, but you get to the end of the day and suddenly you're in your quiet room and that, that chronic kind of pain or, uh, reasserts itself. It's sort of a, an absence at the heart of life that we feel and and that's a real thing it shouldn't be it shouldn't be just sneered at it shouldn't be seen as a weakness it shouldn't be seen as you're doing it wrong then right 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 <laughs> you know it, it's a very human thing and hu human nature will always reassert itself and so the things you're saying are, are spot on it's not it doesn't matter how many bumper stickers you throw at people people will exactly they will still feel what they feel so unless you address that honestly you're not really helping people you're just alienating them more and more making them feel alone in their pain 100% and i think that like you can't you can't like hide that what that what reality is I, and i what I wanted, you said something earlier that I, I wanted to ask you about. I was going to ask you about it later on, but since we're talking about something, you know, do you feel or do you see in your world that people are having less and less relationships? There's less connectivity with human beings because of, like, we we're laughing about apps and like technology being, and even Instagram, people are, are so distracted or they're relying so much on these like, uh, you know, these online, you know, relationships and likes and followers that they're really kind of like unable now to create relationships offline. Do you see like a, do you see a trend in this? I think that we have, we forget what the original idea of some of these things was, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about whether these companies meant this to be the idea or right. what you know what, what right. their ultimate goal was but i mean Oops. the the people who joined these in the first place it really should have been about making it more efficient to meet people in the first place if you were using it to find love right and and there's something really cool about that i mean there is something cool about the fact that there's someone i never would have met probably in real life because even if they live only a few blocks down. Right. They go to a different coffee shop, a different gym. A, they work in a different building. And so our paths never intersect. Yeah. And yet a few streets down might be the love of my life. There's something really cool about the idea that from my bedroom, I can meet that person. But it then it becomes kind of... Uh, deracinated from that yes. and it ends up being well now I'm using it to get a feeling while I'm on it and and we get addicted to that feeling as we all know I'm the last person to say it but it, you know that the feeling itself becomes very addictive and it distracts us from what it is we actually started for we started because we wanted a real connection we wanted that meaning in our lives we wanted to to build a relationship and very quickly people end up doing none of the things that would actually help them do that how much time are you spending texting someone you met on an app before you say you know what enough is enough if this doesn't turn into an actual phone call or a date right then why am i still doing this this doesn't this isn't serving me but it's very common for us to get four weeks in, we still haven't 
met up with this person, but we're still pinging messages back and forth because on some very superficial level, it gives us a little hit of very non-nutritional connection. Yeah. And, and it's just, for, it's very easy to get distracted from why we were doing it in the first place. And of course, you know, again, that buffet mentality that these things create is in itself really, really difficult because it, it doesn't really model how relationships are built, how attraction works. I think everyone has had the experience of either working in the same office as Mm -hmm. someone or seeing the same person at their gym every week. And maybe they didn't start off thinking this person, they didn't, it's not like that. The first day they walked into their office, that person just bowled them over. But a few weeks or months and they get to know this person and they start to develop feelings. Right. To like them. To like them. Yeah. And and a lot of people have had that experience. It wasn't day one explosive. It was, no, I, I started to connect with this person and feel attraction and it grew. It's why many people have had the experience of being attracted to someone who wasn't their type. Because mm-hmm. although on paper they would go, this person's not someone I'd be attracted to, they saw them in full color in life and animating and that's so true and I, they go this, oh my god I, I i i'm attracted to this person it is curious it's a curious feeling when that happens but it happens yeah well if someone showed you a picture of that person right. on an app or that person from your office you'd probably just swipe left exactly but, it's so true but the reason that we got attracted to them was because it was allowed to breathe and nothing's allowed to breathe online in that way. And so we just bulldoze people so quickly. Yeah. And we really have no, we forget how nuanced attraction can be and how subtle it can be. And that the people we never thought would end up being the love of our lives can, and can end up being the love of our lives. But when we're force feeding ourselves like a foie so gras true. duck, uh, people <laughs> on a dating true. app, there's no time to develop any of that. That's right. And then, but it's weird because loneliness is at an all time high with all these new things that people can be, you know, distract, like all these apps and everything else. But yet it's still not stopping people from taking a moment And giving people a chance, because even if I go on a date, let's say I go on a date with this person or that person, and it's decent, I'll just rush back home and just keep on swiping an app because it's now, that's become like what the habitual thing is to do. And that's kind of interrupting like an attraction plot line, if you think about it. Yeah, totally. You you know, what would happen at a certain point in a different era was you'd get home from a date and Mm -hmm. you might be you ha- might have a couple of days to think about that person and your imagination does a lot of the work for you. Yes. Thinking about them. You're in- it's a form of investment thinking about someone. Yeah. Uh, you, they may not know it, yeah. but ev- the whole time you're thinking about this person, you're, you're in your own subtle way, you're investing in them. Yeah. And you, you become more attached to those things that you invest in. Well, if you get back from a, a pretty good date and then you immediately interrupt that circuit, by going online again and scrolling, then yes, true. it doesn't, you, you're taking yourself out of it and it doesn't have that, sp- your imagination doesn't have that space to play in the same way. And so we sort of are, ju- we, 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 just, we just jump like that. And it, it takes a strong person and it takes a very intentional person to subvert that and to say, I'm going to actually, I'm going to, actually see what this person who this person is and give it a minute and it's a tough thing to do i'm not suggesting any of this is easy right it's very hard and we've been conditioned not to do it right but it is the way we come to actually care about you look at anything in your life you're right look at any skill that you've gotten good at Mm -hmm. look at any movie that you've ended up loving look at places you've ended up loving you had to actually invest some time in those 100%. things percent. that is such a good point try imagine someone playing imagine what it takes with a movie you have to really engage with that movie you have to and, and these Pay days and these days it, yeah. people struggle more than ever to do that that's oh, why we like tv shows is because it's one hour or it's 30 minutes it doesn't it's not the 100%. commitment of two hours you know but <laughs> so a movie is feels like a commitment these days but 
the, I can't tell you the number of times I've recently sat down to watch a movie and, and I used to love movies mm -hmm. and I just got out of the habit of watching them and I have sat down to watch a movie and gone, I'm so glad that I actually sat and gave that my attention and invested in it. Yeah. But that's what it takes to, to get something out of a movie. Now imagine that I put 10 TV screens in front of you, all with great movies on. And tell me whether they could be the best 10 movies in the world. You're not going to feel anything from any of them. It's called the paradox of choice, though, right? When you yeah. have too much choice, you end up usually with nothing because it's overwhelming to see all these things. And what you said was exactly the point, which is like, you have to put these things in place for you not to have that problem, like intention, mm -hmm. why you're doing something. Which, by the way, before I... I didn't even, I wanted to ask you, how did you even become this guy? Like you, the way you even describe this stuff and how your, your perspective, I find it lands really well. Like even when you're, you know, when I say something, say something to you and your answers, like there's always like the way you, the, the, like the way your brain works and your responses, I think they're, I think it, there's such thought behind it, but you're not a psychologist, right? You never went to school to be a psychologist. Like, how did you become this guy that you became now? Like, I know you wrote the book, Get a Guy, many years ago, but you've been doing this for a long, long time. So what is your origin? Like, how, how are you the relationship guy? I, the, I suppose there's, as, as always, there's short answers and, and long answers yes, to right. that. Give me a medium answer. The, me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the medium answer, the one hour Netflix series <laughs> answer is... The, the, limi the, the limited, um, what do you mean? The, we're, we're distracted so easily. So give us like the snapshot of it. I, I used to be insecure about this question because I used to think that, in, mm. you know, years ago I used to think what well, is my qualification and you know some people have master's degrees in this stuff or they're trained therapists or psychologists and um i don't i don't feel insecure anymore i i just i've done it a long time it's always been a passion of mine is I, ideas being able to mm, I, i've always loved understanding people mm -hmm. and the craft as i see it is can you take and un if, if you pay attention enough to the patterns with people, can you then take what you've seen and articulate it in a way that, as you put it, lands? Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is new, and, and I don't have any kind of arrogance around the idea that anything I'm saying is new. I just, I just love the craft. I love being able to take something and say it in a way that, you know, the greatest compliment is I, I feel like, my mum or my therapist or my best friend has been trying to tell me some version of this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the way you just said it, it connected. Yeah. I, I take that as a great compliment because it is a compliment. How do you make it speak to someone now? And I, you know, my, my journey journey was being 11 years old and picking up how to win friends and influence people off my dad's bookshelf. Oh, I love that and book. I, you know, I read it at the time because I had a sort of private, interest in the subject because I just thought god that's so at first I was like that's a strange title for a book and then I read it and I was so hooked I, I, I was a very shy and introverted kid and I loved the idea that you you could do something about that you weren't just condemned yes to however you were that was really really I honestly felt like I didn't realize when I was 11 years old and I picked up that book that it was a huge seminal foundational <laughs> self-development book I thought I discovered some sort of secret scroll that no one else knew about wow and I read it and it really blew me away. I, I just thought, I can't believe you can learn to be better at these things. Uh, cut to me being, I don't know, 14 or 15. My, I'd read a lot of books of that nature by that point. Right. And I was kind of hooked. And then my friend in school one day came to me and he said, my dad takes his company to see this guy every year. His name's Tony Robbins. And I have a ticket to give a friend because my dad's making me go. So do you want to come with me? And what he didn't know is that I'd already read his book. I had already wow. been so engaged with right. that content. And it was like, a, it was like winning the lottery for me to be able to go to something like that. Wow. And so I accompanied him and his dad 
to this event. And that became the kind of marriage of the content that I was loving mm -hmm. and the delivery, which I had never seen anyone deliver anything at that level before and be able to, to impact a crowd on that level. And that became a real fusion for me where some, so it's not like I decided at that point, that's what I was going to do, but that that's where it all started for me. And by the time I was uh, in my early twenties, I was starting to work with anyone who would let me. <laughs> <laughs> like what would be your first job in it? Like what would be your first paid gig doing this? You know, I did. So I, started helping people one-on-one -on -one. um and i had a friend who i'd made who in london was doing these very tiny events and i said can i just come and help i'll i don't mind i'll you know I, I, i'll be a warm-up even for five minutes whatever just right he i'm talking he had like five or six people that would come to these events oh. these were not like right. hundreds of people in a room or thousands of people it's just a handful but he got he he saw in me someone who would help for free yeah. and i saw a stage i saw a possibility of exploring out loud all of these ideas that i'd been learning for so long and it was really valuable to me because long before anyone knew me i was able to cut my teeth as a speaker as someone oh. formulating ideas weekend in weekend out for 3 or 4 years in private and what doing it, what like you go on stage and what do you, you pick a topic I was talking about confidence oh, and, com and what I'd learned and nothing like revolutionary but I was yeah. just talking about what I had learned so far right and it was well confidence is a big one for you right like your whole thing is for women be strong and confident is a through line of how to get a guy right like right. I couldn't agree more by the way but I mean but those are things that are the foundations and you so you'd go up on stage and be like I want to talk to you guys about confidence I talk or about confidence especially with regards to social anxieties mm -hmm. and struggling to talk to people I had experienced my own version of that and uh, had developed much more courage than I had in years prior so it was really I, you know, I was my own first experiment right. in all of this. And uh, which is why it's funny to me whenever someone says something like, why do you need all this? Just be yourself or whatever. I'm always like, well, you're kind of invalidating everything I've done for myself. <laughs> yeah. Because this is this has been my life for longer than you've ever known me and my work. I've been doing this for me. It's, right. This is these skills that that I learned at an early age have been essentially behind everything I've ever been able to do for myself from writing books to uh, TV, having TV shows, traveling the world, speaking, building a, a company with a, an amazing team. This is, this is what I, or, or even, you know, we have the number one YouTube channel in the world for dating advice and half a billion views on that channel. And the, I credit everything I've learned right. with my ability to, capture someone's attention in that way and build an audience in that way. So yeah. I always just feel like people are missing something when they say, oh, you just don't, you don't need all of this. I, I think. But exactly. But I, actually I, you do. You right? do need. Yeah. And it, you don't need all of it all the time in every moment, but you, you can get better. Like you, 100%. Can, you can absolutely get better. And your love life is not a special category of life where this stuff doesn't apply. Like everywhere else in life, you learn things that can make you better, whether it's a sport, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's a new job. No one starts you on your first day of work at a new company and says, just be yourself, I'll see you in a year. <laughs> exactly. No one says that. But then as soon as you start talking about people's love lives, people go, you don't need to learn anything, just be you. And I just think, what special privilege do you think this area of life has to not needing any learning? I think that's so true, especially because you're dealing with another person, right? Like, and then you have to, you do have to, that's the, I think that's, this is an area where you have to have more help. Like it's essential. Actually, I've needed it. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've made so many mistakes in my life. I've, I've got it wrong so many times. I have amazing people over the years that I've gone to for advice and you know, the, I, I just don't. I'm all, I don't, I, know, I never understand it. I, I'm always looking yeah. for how I can do better. I mean, who hasn't in the course of their adult life realized that in relationships, there's a, 
good way to have an argument and a really bad way. Right. And the bad way can result in a breakup very quickly. And the good way can result in a huge amount of compassion and understanding and love and getting over it very quickly. If you understand that, then you understand that, of course, there are things to learn right. for all of us. And the same is true on a first date. There are great ways to have a first date and there are not great ways to have a first date. It applies to every part of the process. So how did you learn these things? Like, what was your process? Like you, like, did, is it trial and error on different, based on the different relationships you've had and what's worked, what hasn't? Because you specialize so much in what, for women, is it because you use like the fact that what would you, like how a woman would, how you would respond to a woman's actions? Like, are you giving your, like, are you basically using yourself as like the benchmark? Basically, this is what happened. I, this relationship got screwed up because this is what the dynamic was. And then you kind of like try to figure it out. There are no doubt times over the 15 years that I've been doing this where I've drawn on those things. Right. But that to me is a very weak Way argument for knowing that you have something of value to right. people. You know, I used to, I had journalists often say to me early in my career, you know, this is, this is so interesting because you're a man giving this advice and you know men, so that's what works about it. And I thought to myself, what a cheap argument. It's trite. It's very, it's it so is. It's cheap. It is. It's like, it's very limiting. By that, by that standard, any man should be on a stage giving advice to people. 100%, like it, right? And we know that's not true. So, it, no, I, I, I started out having done a, dis, a, 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 um, an enormous amount of learning behind the scenes that was self-taught and books that I read and understanding patterns in people, I, I pay attention. I, I'm always picking up on things in, mm -hmm. in the way people operate and what people seem to respond to and what they don't seem to respond to. But at this point, it's no longer my idea of what may or may not work. I mean, it's literally millions of people yeah. that I've been able to reach over 15 years and in my live events, hundreds of thousands. And so you, you see the patterns, you see what works and what doesn't. And, and I wasn't driven by, you know, there was in, in terms of over helping people overcome their kind of social anxieties, mm -hmm. I was definitely driven by a sort of personal feeling right. of, I've really struggled with this in my life and I've learned things that have helped me. I've learned things that help me approach people. I've learned things that help me talk to people and have great conversations. I've learned things that help me get on stage and give a speech. You know, that, that, those things, absolutely, there's a kind of autobiographical journey that's yeah. happened there. But the thing that's really driven me over the years is the, the women in my life, the people that I've loved more than anyone else, who um, who I've seen put up with the wrong things for far too long and and me trying to get to the bottom of why 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 didn't they leave sooner why did they decide that this was what they were worth why didn't why what didn't they know or what was missing or what what part of themselves was in need of healing that that they kept doing this over and over again and 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 anyone who's listening to this will will probably know that feeling with someone in their life mm -hmm. or or themselves right where they there's they they're, they're, it's one of the tragedies that, of life that they have witnessed to see someone they love so much um sacrifice so much of their life when you know that they could have been so much happier. Right. And, and that, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen that, I've seen it in all genders, but I've seen it so much in women who I, I've, I sh I've watched them throw away enormous portions, if not their whole lives. Totally. And if I can, if I can help people not do that, that to me is genuinely saving someone's life. I, I don't mean that in the grandiose sense. I really mean no, that, I agree with that you. saves someone's life. Do you think, so what would be the number one thing that you think that why women stay? Is it because of low self-esteem, um, fear? What is the main thing that why we do that? This, 
that that's a a big question and there and there are multiple factors you know there's childhood wounds the things that we're still trying to heal or a story we're mm -hmm. still trying to complete yeah um a, a lack of self-worth is a big one but sometimes um Sometimes it gets confusing because people can say that for everything. Mm -hmm. Like you just need to have more self-worth. Yeah. And I think sometimes it actually can, though they may be right, it can sometimes pull the conversation in a direction that isn't always helpful because if you grew up with a certain set of conditioning, right. if you grew up modeling your parents or some caregiver that, that either wronged you or didn't give you the treatment that you should have had, didn't model the things that should have been modeled about a healthy relationship that it, it almost, you almost have to frame that in terms of that's actually just what you know. Right. You know, it's not always the same. It may all be, always be connected to the self-worth conversation because what you have to learn is what it looks like to value yourself more and to have boundaries and standards and to trust yourself right. that you'll take care of yourself in the company of other people and you won't let people do those things to you. But, but you know, so much of what we do, we do because it's just what we know. That's exactly. So how do you teach this stuff? Because these are all overarching, you know, words, right? Self-worth, la yeah. lack of self-esteem, self-confidence. Okay. Now, you know, so let's say we now know it. What do you do about it? Yeah. Well, the, Oh, and I, I want to add one more just because it's, it's important, I think. There are some people who have great, a great sense of self-worth and they've grown up in healthy situations, mm -hmm. but they come across someone mm. who is an animal they don't understand. That's a good point. If you, you know, it's some, sometimes we go for certain people because they're what we know. And other times we tolerate certain people because we don't know. <laughs> Such a good point. And we've never, we don't, you know, there's a, there's a video that I saw on YouTube of, uh, a, there was a, like crocodiles in a zoo mm -hmm. and someone, a spectator to these crocodiles is filming. I don't know if there were crocodiles or alligators. I'm going to say crocodile. Okay. I won't hold you to it. It's okay. Thanks. <laughs> you're welcome. I'm not an expert you're, you're in this gonna, area. You're not going to lose brownie points with it, okay? <laughs> I don't want to speak on yeah. subjects I don't know. But this... A uh, reptile of some kind. Right. A yeah. very large, large reptile. Yes. Um, prehistoric looking. <laughs> it, they were just laying there. And one of the crocodiles bit off the other crocodile's leg. Just out of nowhere. And... And then just carried on as if nothing happened. And the other crocodile, by the way, just sort of carried on as if nothing happened. Now with three legs instead of four, which I think is the number that what? crocodiles have. <laughs> I think so too. I don't know for sure. So it, it was like, that's, a, that's like an animal that I don't understand. Yeah, that's right. That's not a dog. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like, right. That's not a dog does, doesn't bite another dog's leg And then off, carry on. And then carry on as if nothing. And the other one yeah. carries on as if nothing happened. That is a different... S different kind of situation. Totally. There are people in life that are like that. There are people that we do not understand. And when you come across one of those people, for example, narcissists, you, you don't know how to handle a person like that because it's not in your vocabulary of, of human dynamics to understand a pathological liar or someone who will gaslight you to that extent or you just don't know. So it's, we also have to p create space for that experience too. Not okay. everyone is sort of blind and, and bewildered or low self-worth or has a miserable childhood. There are just people that they're like, I, I don't, I, I They've never experienced never have it. seen someone like this coming. Yeah. So, um, there's that too, but you, you asked the question, what do you, what do you do when you start to see that, it's either to do with your self-worth or patterns. I, I am a big believer in this idea that belief is really hard to acquire. Really hard. Mm -hmm. It's the self-development world sort of 
to me, really undersells how hard belief is to 100. acquire. These are all like very, very cool in the moment hashtags right now. Even by the way, narcissist and tra like all these things are like very popular they words. Are. And it doesn't really land because now you hear it so much. Well, now everyone's a narcissist. Now, now, so now it, everyone's exactly yeah. every guy's a narcissist just because he doesn't like you. Like, right. do you know what I'm or saying? Didn't text you back. It doesn't weeks. text you back. It, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that I, I, you and I are on the same page. Yes. I, I think we have to be careful with language. Yeah. Um, but there are the the idea of just believe something. If you take an example like you've been cheated on a lot mm -hmm. or you've had a string of people that you couldn't, you learned, Oh my God, I, I, I've had my trust broken so many times that now your trust is broken. Sort of independent of those people. Now you go out into the world and with that, yeah, now that's your thing that you've, that's my story. Yeah. yeah. And, and you have this combination of not trusting your own judgment, not trusting other people. Mm hmm the your exes or especially it, it doesn't have to, have to be multiple it could be one person that you spent a lot of time with and gave a lot of different chances to always hoping that they would change always thinking if you invested more or gave more empathy right. gave more understanding that they would evolve as a person that they wouldn't do this to you and it turns out that they were going to do the same thing over and over and over again regardless of how you behaved well you can leave that relationship and now you just think that's your brain doesn't necessarily separate that person from everybody else. It may do logically. You may be able to verbalize that. Yeah, I get it. It's just, you know, my ex was a specific kind of person, a specific right. kind of bad. And, and I know not everyone's like that, but internally the two can quite easily yeah. become conflated. And now all of a sudden it feels like just people represent danger especially romantically. Mm -hmm. And now I go out into the world with these trust issues. How do you, how do you get over that? And if someone come, if a coach comes to you and says, you just have to, you have to trust, you have to learn to trust people. You have to believe that people can be trusted. Fine. But there's, you haven't had reference points for that. Right in recent history or maybe ever. Right. So for you to believe that, it's like taking someone who has never made more than 5,000 a month and telling them that they could generate a million a month. Right. It, it's, it's just, it becomes silly. Uh, it does become silly, but then if you go on this stuff, they're like, "Oh, you have to have an abundance mindset, or versus right. a this mind, you know, or you know what I mean." Like, and then people feel guilty because they don't have those natural feelings, versus yeah. getting to the root cause. Because these are all again, like, I have a real problem with what's happening in the zeitgeist of the world right now, right? Because of this of this exact thing, these are all just overarching things like lip, you have limiting beliefs and this is a narcissist or like have an abundance mindset. Right. Okay. But this is not my reality. So what do I do to kind of shift my behavior mm. in a real way? I think the answer to it is a weirdly subtle uh, and unexpected. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I think curiosity is like a gateway drug for belief. Okay. Oh my gosh. Do you, okay. So I just wrote a whole, I just did a whole thing on this and I said exactly no the same word. Yes. In my book, I wrote a whole chapter on this and I literally said that it's a gateway. It's a gateway yeah. drug. I totally agree with you. It, if you can remain curious, you, you can get the wedge in the door that you need mm -hmm. to be able to change the way you think or what you believe or what your experience of this life is. And to be curious, you only really need to know that not everyone in life is having the same experience you are. Mm -hmm. That there do seem to be some healthy relationships. There do seem to be people in this world that are good, some. There do seem to be people that are having a better time or better go of it. And it, it's an arrogance for us to think that the way my experience of life is the only experience mm -hmm. of life because it's not. You don't have to believe that 
something way, way, way better as possible. You don't even have to believe any of that. You just, you just have to concede that, and you only need to look at your own past to know that. There mm -hmm. will be things that at certain points in your life you didn't like that you liked at some point. Right, like a right. food. There will be a food that one day you, you <laughs> said, I hate that food. And then you have somehow miraculously, you, you've now become a fan of that food. Right. Or even, it doesn't even have to be a food you didn't like. It's like a food you discovered that once you tried it, you went, oh my God, I didn't know that this thing that's now my favorite right. was something that was available to me as my favorite. When you understand that, that you've changed your mind about several things, that you've learned better ways of doing things, you realize, oh, it, it's arrogant for me to think that in five years, there won't be more of those things. There right. will be more of those new things or new ways of being. I, we, you and I were talking before we started about me having done the Wim Hof retreat with a oh, group yeah. of 10 guys. And I hated the idea of the cold. But, you know, I, I've come out of that experience and my relationship, I could never have believed that my relationship with the cold would be what it is today. But now I associate it with excitement and adventure, not something to be deeply feared. Right, right, right. I could never have predicted that I would change in that way. Now, I didn't go into the Wim Hof retreat in Poland thinking this, I'm going to be good at this. Right. I went in thinking I'm going to be terrible at this. I'm going with a group of superhuman men <laughs> and I'm going to be the worst in the class. And this is going to be really brutally painful and I'm not going to enjoy it. But I was curious. I just said, you know what? I, let me not worry about being last in class. Let me just go and be curious about this. And that's paid massive dividends for me. So the thing I teach people in their dating lives is what's something that emotionally your brain has kind of decided. Right. But you could be curious about what happens if I do something different to what I've done before. If instead of getting jealous and becoming very quiet with my jealousy, what if I expressed it to someone in an honest and vulnerable way? What if I did that? Now, you may not get a perfect result. It may still get another undesirable result, but it will be a different result. Right. And different is good. Different when is you're good. trying to dislodge your beliefs, just getting a different result than the one you used to opens you up to the fact that there are more worlds available to you than the one that than the very well-worn groove that you have settled into for a long time. And once you start messing with your that's why I tell people mess with your beliefs. Don't try and believe something different. Just mess with your current mm. belief. Screw around with it and and see what happens when you mess with it. Cuz that's much more manageable. Being yeah. curious and messing with your current belief is much more manageable than some s kind of platitudinous believe this thing instead. Right. You know, it, that that's a huge leap for people. And, and you know, if you want to, you only need to be curious. You only need enough initial motivation. Like so, something hasn't worked for long enough or is making you miserable enough that you say, screw it, I will try something, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'll try, because this is not, who, who am I helping by continuing to stay in this groove? This just sucks. I, I, all, I consistently feel bad, or I consistently feel anxious, I consistently feel like I don't trust right. anybody. I, I grew up struggling with trust. I didn't really realize this until more recently in life. Mm. I, I, I I didn't, I always sort of felt like people had an agenda of some kind. Really? Yeah. I, I, and, Why and do it, you think that is? I don't know. I, some combination of learning from people around me or just, you know, maybe the kind of the segment of society that I grew up around. Right. Or I, my, my family are all from the East end of London and I, you know, it's a, <laughs> I don't know. It's not, it's not the Queens. Right, 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 uh, right. So you always had like, you always kind of were I think thinking was a little bit of like, you know, people yeah. are always out 
for themselves. themselves. Yeah. There's always a hidden agenda. No one's doing anything nice for free. It sounds like LA, the east side of well, London. The <laughs> 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 Sounds exactly like LA. Could not be more different places, yeah. but yeah. No, but still, the, it, no, the, I get it. The I energy is very That's similar. Really like, hmm, what can I do? What can you do for me before I'm nice to you? Yeah, you and know, I, I kind of that hurt me. Yeah, that hurt me because while I I have a I've always had a, a a generous heart and I love people and I as soon as I feel safe, yeah, I want to give the world to people. Right. Oh, but yeah. I. Had realized how much of my life I spent not Doing feeling that. safe to let my guard down and do things for people. So I had to, the irony is I then had too much of a kind of tit for tat yeah. mindset. And that, as you know, from business, that doesn't serve you because there's no reciprocity to that. It's right. not, you're not going in with the right intentions. And, and I, what I would do over time is I started I started observing that there were people around me who a weren't like that in the not I don't mean they weren't like that in that they were trustworthy I meant that they weren't like that in the way they approached other people right right I'd see friends of mine who would get screwed over and they would still have this generous spirit about them right oh. where they didn't let it kind of affect them affect them they kind of brushed it off and they might, it might affect how they, how much they gave to that person next time, but it didn't, it, it didn't change who they were with people in general. And I just realized, and, and especially when I saw people like that doing better in life, yeah. when I saw them like getting results that I wanted for myself. Right. And I don't mean achievement wise. I mean, just emotionally, I they seem like happier people. They seem more at peace. Totally. I just went, I want to be like that. That's. The, it's not that they never get screwed over. It's that they just have, it's like they've decided that life will be better yeah. if they just go in with a generous spirit and they don't assume that everyone's got an agenda. And even if they, right. if someone turns out to have an agenda, so be it, it's fine. You know, just redirect my energy. I, I've started to really admire that. And, and so that, that's a kind of curiosity when you see someone who's not like you and you like something about that person yeah you really learn about them but that's also i think that's more being very uh like you said earlier also you you notice these things you're very you, you kind of pay attention and you pick up on people's body language how they're how they act the dynamic like you're just someone who's naturally it seems very interested in in that human nature of how people act and that's what it is more than is it more? Is it curiosity, or is it more just observing I th I suppose and picking the, up on the observe? The curiosity is when I learn, when I see something. Right. I'm not afraid to ask that person questions. Yeah. I'm not afraid to, you know. I I remember a time when I was getting jealous in my relationships. Right. And my cousin Billy <laughs> has been in a relationship since he was in his early twenties. A very happy, peaceful relationship. Very rarely argue no jealousy and it's such a it's a wonderful relationship yeah. that they've had all through their 20s and now into their 30s and you know i i would i would look at like my cousin billy and i'd be like so why doesn't he get jealous I, i'm not afraid to ask that question right, you like should, yeah. hey so so why didn't you get jealous with this thing right. like, why does that not make you jealous I, I'm, I'm just curious and then he would say something and i'd go Oh wow, he sees it. So, he's like really made a different decision right. about the way he thinks about things or about the meaning that he ascribes totally. to things. And once I realize that, it then becomes obvious why his experience was different than mine at the time and why I was getting into fights with people, why I was feeling wounded or insecure about something that someone just said or comparing myself to somebody else. And and Billy was just experiencing a, this incredible level of peace in his relationship. It wasn't that none of the things that were happening to me were happening to him. Right. It's that he had a very different way of processing all of it. And when I see that, I, I always want to be close to people like that because they know something I don't. Right. And I can learn from that. And, and, and that to me is the basis of of new belief is that you start to try new things. You put yourself around new people. It will feel unsafe to you. Weirdly, even if it's better, 
it will feel unsafe to you because it's not what you know. Right. I, I have a friend who dated a really awful guy in her late, in, a ver, in her early 20s. And then when she dated the next guy, he was a beautiful guy, an amazing human being. And she said to her mum, mum, I don't understand. He's so nice to me. Like I, it was like she, yeah, could, she, she didn't know what to do with it. And her mum said, that's how it's supposed to be. But for her, it almost felt unsafe. We don't think of that as not being safe, but yeah. psychologically it feels unsafe. It's because uncomfortable because it's not what you know. No, it's that's, unmapped territory. Right, so that's why people constantly go back to their pattern of what they know because it feels safe even though it's not safe. I know my way around this yes. thing. I don't know my way around that thing. And that feels unsafe to me. Yeah. And so... It, what I'm always trying to do in my own life, obviously this is, forms the basis of so much of my coaching with other people too, but what I'm always trying to do for me is expand the territory yeah. of what I am familiar with so that I can, that thing yeah. that's actually really, you know, what fear of success for so many people is, a f is it's, that, um, it's the same feeling. Yeah. I never used to understand a fear of success. I, I used to be like, someone needs to explain that to me i had it by the way i just didn't really think of it right. in that way but i i you know in my own way i've always had it because i've always had that feeling of like I, when i get too yeah. far i start to find a way to to like bring myself back down i, I would even have it with the gym i'd like have this weird moment where <laughs> i'd get to a certain point with my body where I'd, like it was an it was a millimeter beyond where i'd been before and it was like, <laughs> that was the night that I would go out and have the binge of the year. Well, yes. Why do we do that? That's a hundred percent true. <laughs> like once we see ourselves like thriving yeah. a little bit above where we normally see ourselves, we like, we self-sabotage. I, I honestly believe that it's on some level is what we know. We're like, I know what it is to maintain this sort of a body. I don't know what it is to be. I've never so been psychologically. that. I've never been that guy. I don't, and I don't think it's logical. I think the problem we is we try to find logic for it. And, and of course, like with the gym example, there might be a sense of, yeah. oh, I feel like I've gotten to this point. Now I can, now I can binge True. eat because I've, I've got to this point. Now I've got a license to give myself that cracky thing that I need. Yes. But the... I, I really, because I've seen the pattern in myself in all sorts of different areas of Scenarios, my life. Scenarios. Yeah. yeah. I, I really think it's just this, I've not been here before. I don't know it. I don't feel, there's some discomfort with going into that room that I've not been into yet. I know my way around this room right now. I, I you know, even the difficult parts of it, I, I just know my way around it. I don't know my way around that room. Uh, you know, the same can be true. I work too much. It's a hundred percent true. I, you know, I feel less comfortable taking time off. I'm working on that. And I have a lot of work to do there. Um, Oh, and then but, I gave you all those other things to do before. And then when, we st <laughs> when I first arrived, you said I should be... Why aren't you doing this, this, yeah, this, yeah, this? exactly. <laughs> I, but I... I, oh, I, God, I feel <laughs> terrible now. <laughs> That's why I laughed when you said it, because I was like, this is the worst thing for me to hear. <laughs> but That's but, so funny. But, you know, that's... Me... Me working hard and achieving things and forging ahead, I know that. Yeah. I know that. I know my way around that. I've always done that. Yeah. It, it's familiar. Know, it's familiar. The other ways of living and experiencing life, taking a real break, a real time out, stepping away, that's unknown. Yeah. And it may be better, but it's unknown. And that's the thing that, I think all of us need to understand about change is that when, when better is unknown, don't underestimate how far out of your way you'll go to not go and explore that yes. territory, even if it's guaranteed to be better than where you are now, because we, we want familiar, even if, even if in some cases familiar is hell. That's so true. Actually, it really is. I mean, you said something earlier and I, we didn't talk about that also about social anxiety. Why? Like, I feel like even I notice, even with me, I'm married now, but I, why is it when we like social, social anxiety, when we like somebody even, 
we end up acting weird or different and it ruins the entire dynamics. <laughs> and so like you, you're showing up not even as yourself yeah. and it's because you have this like, anxiety. Like, why do we do this? How do we get over this? Because I think this is like a big the stop is in the start or the start is in the stop, right? Like, doesn't that happen? I would imagine you get asked this question a lot or people confront this a lot in their lives. Mm. Like when we don't like someone, we, we're, the, we're the funniest, we're great, we're charming, we're charismatic, everyone, you know what I mean? The second you like somebody, it's awkward and weird. And then like, it's which game is, over. Which is exactly why I always remember reading, and, and actually I'm not dissing the book because I, I haven't seen it in a long time. I, for all I know, I'd agree with a lot of it. But there was a, there was a, a specific part in the book, The Rules, that... Oh, that book from a long but, time yeah, ago, but yeah. Years ago. It must have been 20 years old. I remember reading that book, and there was a line in it that never rang true for me because it said something like, if a guy doesn't come over to you, don't bother. He's not interested. And that was almost like moments like that would give me excitement because I, when I felt something being said that seemed so, so the contrary of what I right. felt as true. I saw that's an opportunity for me to go and have some impact. And that one seemed to me so patently false because my whole life I had been avoiding the very girls I wanted to talk to. Isn't that most people though? Right. But, no, but it I, I guess too, the, it the assumption is that men being the I, hunters I agree. that we are the alphas. Have, this, have this Danny Zuko confidence everywhere we go and right. can waltz up to anyone. And for me, you know, I wasn't, I, I, you know, I, it's not like I grew up unable to talk to a human being. I, I was, you know, affable at school. I had great friends. I was friends with everybody, but you give me the one person yeah. that I actually fancied, yes. uh, as we would say in yes, England, liked, I, I th in that moment I'd freeze. So you're right. It's a very common experience that the, the Look, the reason, which may not help people an awful lot, but it is worth saying, is that we're overvaluing something in them and we're undervaluing something in ourselves. We have put something on a pedestal. Uh, and it may even be not them that we've put on a pedestal. It's what we think th this is going to do for us mm -hmm. if it goes well. It's a bit like going into a job interview and you, you're convinced that your happiness lies on the other side of a yes. Yes. And therefore now I am sweating going into this job interview because I, I think this is the key to all of my problems in life. And I think when you realize that nothing is the key to all of your problems in life, you stop putting anything on a pedestal. Yeah. There, there, that thing doesn't exist. So there's that. We can also... Um, we can also warm up for situations, which is important, practically speaking. So what's you, you can go into a room and instead of one of the big mistakes we make when we think someone is attractive is we save up all of our energy for going up to them at some point. <laughs> and we sit there and we think for a long time about what would I say if I went over there? And it's, that's the exact energy that, hurts us when we go over there totally it's a bit like when someone has written a text message and you can see from the text message they must have spent a lot of time like thinking preparing about it yes. because it's too good perfect there's something too perfect about it it's yes. too thought out it's too well lettered so it exactly. doesn't have the feeling of someone who you know just confidently sent a message uh, it Instead, it has the feeling of neurosis to it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's what we do with people when we're attracted. So what I, I used to call it, I don't know, I need to think up a new name for this. I haven't said this in, in a long time, but this idea of two-hit theory, the idea that if you walk into a room, the, one of the best things you can do is have immediate interactions with people. Uh, if it's a coffee shop, have an immediate interaction with the barista have an immediate quick interaction with the person next to you i'm not talking about going around and kind of spend getting in everyone's face and having these conversations i'm just saying quick interactions um when you do that especially with people that you know there's something about an attractive person or someone we've deemed to be attractive we're all we're immediately thinking what they can do for us this right. person can make me happy if they say yes yeah 
this person can make me excited if they want me. This per we're trying to get something. Right. So I, so that takes us in already into this sort of very selfish mode. And our fear comes from that selfish mode because we're not thinking about their experience. We're not thinking about providing any value. It's like stepping on stage for a speech. Mm -hmm. If I step on stage and I'm trying to be impressive, we're in trouble already, <laughs> me and the yeah. audience. <laughs> Because, that's right. When, well, that's true, though. Yeah, because it's all about me. And if I'm trying to look cool up there, we have a problem. We are not going to connect. If I go into that room going, let me get, uh, let me understand these people. They all had to move stuff around to be here. They all, you know, someone right. got a dog sitter, someone got a babysitter. They, you know, they traveled, they paid for parking. They, you know, they... And, and they did it because there's something they want to solve. There's some pain they have or there's something they want to improve on. How can I help? Like if I can go into that place, then it's no longer about me. That's why I, I always think the cure for shyness is to know that that feeling you have, that you wish someone would come over and make you feel at home at the party, you have to go give that feeling to somebody else because there are other versions of you standing around right now although they may have brave or good poker faces there are people like you standing around wishing that someone would come and make them feel at home in this place mm -hmm. and and if you can go to that place it's almost like i want to encourage people to see shyness as selfishness because mm -hmm. it's a reframe that's actually very helpful like when you're being shy, you're being very very you know no one wants to be selfish everyone wants to be generous well a generous act is to go make someone else feel at home when you're scared because they're scared too. Yeah. And that puts you in a whole different mindset of going and actually being compassionate to other people. And that then gets you out of your own head and getting out of your own head is a cure for shyness. Yeah. That's so a good trick. It's want, a really, yeah. Yeah, I like, I want more of these tricks. That, that has one. helped me an enormous amount is there's another me in this room. And the, so when, when we two hit theory is let me not overthink my first interactions with anybody. Right. Let me just, when I go into a room, interact. And the benefit of that is twofold. Firstly, if at some point you end up going to talk to that person that you'd really like to talk to, you're already kind of warmed up. Mm -hmm. You've not gone from being Mr. or Mrs. Unsociable to suddenly I'm now going to be this ball of charisma walking right. up to someone. <laughs> Instead, you're just graduating. You've already been going at 30 mile an hour. Now you're just, you know, it's just a continuation of the same energy. It's just towards a new person. The second real benefit of this, if you want to meet people in general, is that m most people, when they go out, only go out with one or two other people. Right. right? And... If you are the person that has even a moment of a friendly interaction with one of those people, right. you're immediately their fourth best friend in the room. If they came with three other people, you're the, you were mildly approachable. You said, what are you drinking there? That looks good. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's that? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I might try one of those. Hey, have a good night. And you now are their fourth best friend in this room because... They only know three other people. Right. When, uh, let's say you're still in that room an hour from now or 30 minutes from now, when that person is looking for a new person to talk to, who's the person they're most likely to branch out to first? Their fourth best friend in the room. Right. That's a good, that's a good one. When and you're you can, in, a, in a crowded room, what happens when you're one-on-one -on -one and like you meet somebody and you like them and like, but you know, whatever, you don't really care. It's mm -hmm. like when you don't care, you're like your best personality. Yeah. And then when you start to actually like them, and then that's when you start acting strange and not yourself. Yeah. Then what do you do? Because there's no other people that you can like rely on. You have to, you have to, w w as soon as you've done that, you've gone forward in time. You're no longer in the present. You've, R you've gone forward in time. How did I go forward in time? Because you've made a whole bunch of decisions about this person you cannot possibly know are true. That's true. Well, wait, wait, wait. We, okay, so yes, because what we would do is we'd like, we like meet them, we like them, and then we get to know them, and then we do start like thinking and thinking and thinking, 
And then we end up acting weird. Yeah, because we, right? know, we know one or two things about this person. No, we, we create a whole story in our right. head. We take the 5%, not That's even. That's what girls that we, do anyway. Men right? too. Men too. Why is it men, men suddenly do, fall head over heels for a woman they don't even know? It, women you know, we, do it a lot. Women create a whole story in their head. Of like, there's, This is like the new guy, the best guy, well, their love do, of their life. But I think men are too easily let off the hook. I mean, we're yeah. quite capable of... You know, dis- why why does a woman get creeped out when a guy starts showering her with it's a- true attention and love and affection and and really generous I'll t- acts? I'll tell when you why she doesn't know him that well. I'll tell you why. I think it's the Groucho Marx thing. Have you heard this one? Like whoever likes you, you know, the, the person in the room type of thing. That's what it is. Yes. Yes. The, the the Groucho Marx, what did he say? I wouldn't want to be a member of any club that would have me as exactly. a member. Exactly. It's like the thrill of the chase, feeling like, oh, you know, like they're ungettable, like which it's is a, a challenge. Self, which is a kind of self-loathing, by the way. It is a self-loathing. Right, because it's, it's a, you know, you, uh, you like me. Um, then I don't like you. Gross. But, but the weird thing is, there's another thing in the Jewish, uh, there's a rabbi in the Jewish world, and his whole thing is women all want to be chosen. Everyone wants to feel chosen, right? Yeah. He has a whole thing on this thing, which is true too, which is then the antithesis of the Groucho Marx thing, right? Well, we 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 feel very flattered to be chosen, but I think we want to be... By the right person. We, we want to be chosen by someone we think has a lot of value. <laughs> yes. So is it come, does yeah. it really come down if to who choose, it is? If you choose me and I think you're uncle, <laughs> yeah. yuck. Yeah. It, that, but that's, that's... Then you're a, a creeper. Of, yeah, and that's... There's this... Um, if you're Brad Pitt, then I'd be happy to be chosen by you. Well, if you're in high school, think of how teenagers operate. If you're in high school and you're insecure that you're not cool, the last thing you want is a not cool person hanging around you. Right. That's true. Because you say, you're going to give my, you're going to give me up. Yeah. Like you're going to alert people That's right. to my uncoolness. Right. I can't be seen. If you're super cool, if you're really cool, you don't mind who's around you. No. Nope. Because you're not going to, I might be shining value on you in some way, but you're not going to take mine away from me. Right. You, you know, I'm just, I, I just believe in, in my call. I'm using teenage words here, but the, you know, that's, I, I that, get that's, what the, you're saying. that's yeah. the point is that it's a kind of teenage mindset of if I'm, if I'm not sure of my own value, I can't have you near me if you're not, right. if, if I don't think you have value because it is going to confirm my lack of value. So I need to go find someone who's a certain level of cool and the grown-up words for that are good looking high status powerful wealthy you name it yeah i need to find a certain kind of of person at that level who by being around them raises my value because my value doesn't start there right so we that's where the groucho marx thing comes, comes from. from because we go you don't want me uh you must be onto something Right, you're, exactly. You're, there's something good about you. Right. You, you know, you've seen right through me. You must be great. That's right. And That's so, right. And so it's a very, it's a very, very dangerous place uh, to operate from. And it, give, it says, my value is defined by the people that want me. Um, or how cool the people are that want me. How high value the people are that want me. Okay, so, but what's the answer to... This thing of like when you're like the stories we make up about somebody and we overvalue someone, we undervalue us because of the story well, and we act, start acting strange and weird. We're chasing the wrong things. So, so when, when we're with someone early on and we immediately get nervous and, oh my God, this, this person's amazing and I now must do everything right. Right. And it's I that, don't want to put a foot wrong. That's because we've decided they have all this value. Now, what value do they have? Because tell me, tell yeah. me the value. What what makes someone valuable in a relationship? Like, what would you say makes oh, someone I, really I valuable in a I've relationship? I've heard you talk about this. So if we say things like we got a great connection, like I'm attracted to them, that's all fluff, right? It's they may be they may be prerequisites for a successful relationship. Is that we have some attraction and that we have a great connection, but on their own. 
without the rest. But I wouldn't know the rest yet, right? Because I haven't dated them long enough. Like, I, I, if Which I, is exactly my point, mm. is that they have no real value in your life until you learn the rest. That's true, There are Matthew. four stages of, of, of importance uh, in any relationship. The first one doesn't even constitute a relationship. What is it? Admiration. Right. That's just where you see someone and you think there's something about them. Yep. Okay. The second one is mutual attraction. That's when that person that you see something in knows who you are and also feels something towards you. Okay. So we call that chemistry. We may call it connection if we if we talk about it in a non-sexual context, but both of those things, chemistry and connection. That on its own doesn't count for a lot. As anyone who has had their heart broken by someone who never wanted more with them, even though they had chemistry and connection, knows. So the third stage yeah. of importance is commitment. That's when someone says yes to us and we say yes to them. We say, hey, I don't just admire you. I, we have a mutual attraction. There's actually an exchange here. And we're both saying yes to each other. We want a relationship. We want to actually date each other to the exclusion of other people. That's a commitment. But commitment won't get you all the way there because there's a fourth stage of importance and that's compatibility. Right. You can, and many people will have had a relationship where there was the first three stages, but they absolutely were not compatible. And so even though they said yes to each other, their lives together were really, really fraught and difficult because this person had a completely different, you know, it, look, if you, if someone says yes to you for a relationship, but they have a very uh, fluid relationship with the truth. <laughs> fluid uh, uh, relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't. Yes. Then you're, you're going to have a compatibility issue around that, regardless of the fact that you both committed to each other. So that... Those four things are all necessary or, you know, we can say the first stage is not important at all because you can have admiration for someone and they don't even know you exist. Exactly. Mutual attraction, we think, is the most important thing in the world. And so connection. Connection. Because when Cause you're, you're saying, con see, what you're doing is you're saying your number two, that mutual attraction yep. is the same as connection. It's connection. It's chemistry. It's all of those things that make us feel like there's this explosion of possibility. Uh, okay. Because I think there's, there are two different things. You, I could be attracted to you and have a connection to you, mm -hmm. or I can just be attracted to you because I think you're physically attractive. Right. There's I would put, if, if, if the attraction is one way in that sense, I would put it in admiration. Got it's it. just the first phase. But if, you both are attracted to each other, then it's connection. whether it's just an animal attraction or it's mm. a deeper mindset connection. Gotcha. It still just lives in that phase where there isn't any commitment. There's just, we enjoy this thing. Right. That, and people make a whole relationship on that, by the way. Most people do. Well, people can, well. They get married just on those two things. Well, but then they have commitment. Well, then they have the three things, that, yes. But, but people, what is true is that people can waste years of their life in the second stage of importance where they'll say to me, true. but Matt, we, you know, I have this amazing, I've found this amazing person and we have the most amazing connection and it's whenever we're together, it's like fireworks and we have the best conversations. We can talk about anything. And I always know there's a but coming, right? Because right? otherwise, why say all of this? <laughs> right. And eventually the but is, but he says he's not ready for a relationship. And so what someone is describing there is we're stuck in phase two of importance. We're not in phase three, which is commitment. And people want to act like it's so important because it must be important. We have such an amazing connection. It must be important. We have such an amazing attraction. My argument is, it, while it may be on its own feel quite beautiful, and while it may feel electric and, and, in, and incredible for its own sake, in the context of your future, this is not important for as long as this person isn't saying yes. Right. Why, though? I'm curious. because well, uh, uh, Let me you... paint you a really ridiculous example. Okay. I like these examples, the, Matthew. If... Imagine someone broke up with you. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a good comparison. You meet the love of your life. And then 
a year into your relationship together, you're in this beautiful, exclusive relationship. The two of you are talking about your future together. And then that person gets hit by a car and killed. They're gone. That's a tragedy. Yes. Right? You, you had the love of your life, or so it seemed. Who knows where you would have been in 30 years. The great thing about one-year relationships is you'll never know. You never know. Um, right. but what torture that, that would that be. Not that I'm suggesting there's anything great about yes. someone, you Getting know... Killed in a car accident. Dying a premature Both are death. terrible. Well, I want to but, Yep, go on. But, the, you know, there's a, there's a kind of... Um, it gets to remain perfect in yes, that way. Yes, exactly. Right? I know what you mean. But, yes. But there is something deeply, deeply tragic about losing someone mm-hmm. to a situation like that. Now, let's take a one year relationship where the love of your life says to you, I just don't feel like I'm ready. And months later, that person comes to me and says, Matt, I, the love of my life. I, I can't get over them. They were the love of my life. It, now, we're not talking about someone who got hit by a car. No, and I know. Gone. We're talking about someone who's, yes. who's, who's shopping at Target yeah. <laughs> right now as we speak. They exist. Yes. They're, they're walking the planet. They're still here. Yes. They're, st- they're here right now and they're choosing not to be with you. Right. How long are you going to maintain the story that this is the love of your life? That's a great point. Well, I guess you tell me, you're the expert. It's a story. You have to admit, you, at certain point, you have to say, I am telling myself a story about this person. And I, what I, so true. How what can you I be want a love people to do is marry reality, the, divorce the story, because the story is, I am, I'm, you know, out this my person is out there and they just don't want you know they just don't they they, they, they don't, don't want know it <laughs> it's, but it's like so tell me again what the problem is with the love of your life they don't want you they don't want me exactly well, okay then then this is a story and they may by the way this is where it gets really dangerous the person on the other end will feed that story a lot of the times because it's convenient for them to do so no one wants to be the villain in a breakup. No, everyone wants to be the hero, even when they're doing something that hurts someone else. Totally true. None of us want to be the bad person. So we tell someone something that's incredibly confusing. We don't say, I, I just don't feel attracted anymore, or I just don't feel like I'm happy. I'm, I'm you know, I really want to be with other people. Yeah, they, don't, don't, want, they don't want to say that. We don't say that. We say, we, you know, I'm what, not ready. I'm let, not. Me, let me tell you an excuse. Someone's I, I was in my I have a members club called the Love Life Club. And every month I coach people. And there was a member today. This is straight off of the back of one of my live Q and A's. She said this morning, the guy that I'm have been dating said to me that we have so much attraction and chemistry that he can't focus on anything else in the relationship. And therefore, he, it wouldn't be fair to her for him to continue. No way. Stop it. She believed this nonsense? I'm telling you word for word what I was told today. Now, from the outside, we will go, that is unbelievable that someone <laughs> would believe that. But... But we all have our version of that story where someone has said something to us yeah. that doesn't, that feels really confusing and sort of somehow still allows them to be the, the victim or the good totally. guy or the, you know, like he's the victim in that story. He, he's, he's like, I just it wouldn't be fair to you. I just, I'm so attracted to I've you. I've never heard a guy say that I in my life. I can't folk, no. And we know that it defies all logic. But when we are married to the story, yeah. we want the logic to be true because it gives us an excuse to keep trying. That's so true. I like what you just said. Uh, be married to the reality and divorce the story. It's so, but that's where people get really hung up, right? And they get stuck. They get, they get stuck and they... Look, I, this, is, this should be a mantra for people because I, I really... I'm not, I want everyone to understand. I'm not, I, I'm not coming from a place of ever, 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 ever preaching to people because I know, I'm the one who, when I'm on stage and a woman stands up and tells a story and the rest of the audience groans because they say, how could she have fallen for that? I'm the one who always sticks up for the person because I'm like, no, no, no. I get it. Like, yeah. this, is, 
This has happened to all of us. My sense of urgency comes from the fact that I have seen way too many times how hurt people get. Yeah. I've seen people throw away their lives. It comes from a protective instinct for people. And we have to start saying to ourselves, okay, my, you know, what I was going to say is the mantra is uh, people or relationships are replaceable, but life is not. Life is not replaceable. These years, you don't get a rerun. You can find another partner and one that's much better because any, by the way, any partner that's actually ready is already better than the person who's telling you they're not ready. That's a hundred percent true. They're, they're already better. They already trump that person. I don't care if they don't have the qualities you want or whatever. They're already ahead of the person who says they're not ready. But that's so true. a relationship is replaceable. Your life is not. So we need to start valuing our life more than we value the person in front of us who's not actually meeting our needs, who's not actually giving us what we want. And if someone is giving us this convoluted logic about why they can't proceed, why they can't give us their all, why they can't commit, why it can't be done, you have to apply, you know Occam's razor? Uh, the, the Occam's razor is the, the, the concept that... It, the simplest explanation oh, yes, uh, is, yes. is the is, best. Is the, is the is, actual is, is, answer. Yeah, that's yes. the one you should go with. The one that requires the least variables, the least assumptions. Um, and when someone, and I, I explain this to this person, that when someone is telling you, I can't be with you because I'm too attracted, what's more likely to be true? What's the simplest explanation? That they really are so attracted that they can't, have a normal conversation with you. They can't come see your family. They can't progress with you. They can't keep seeing you. Or that there's some other reason they're not telling you about why they don't want a relationship with you or don't want a relationship at all. And they just don't want to seem like a bad guy. You have to go with the simpler explanation. Did she finally understand and believe you? It was a written uh, question oh. that got sent in, but I, you know, I hope so. And I, you know, I hope it gives, sometimes it's good to get an extreme example like that because it also allows us to hear less extreme versions of it and go, Oh yeah, actually, it, even though it's on a spectrum of completely ludicrous to it, somewhat believable, just because mine is on the somewhat believable end of the spectrum, it doesn't mean I should give more credit to it. I, you know, the, and by the way, it doesn't matter. You don't need closure. This is the thing. Closure is, is overrated. You don't need to know whether what this person is telling you is true. Someone can be telling you, I just don't know, and this and that, and I'm really busy in my life. That's a common one, right? I've got so much on with my business, and I just don't think. And then what people try and do is solve that problem. Yeah. Oh, so you're really busy with the business. Well, look, I have an idea. <laughs> Why don't I help you with the business? Totally. And then I'll do some of this and then we'll have weekends and we'll, I'll come with you when you do that. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you don't need to try and solve the problem they just gave you. What you need to do is say, you have your reasons. It's not up to me to say whether those reasons are true, false, good, bad, overcomable or not, or surmountable or not. That's not for me to worry about. You have your reasons. I have my reality. And my reality is that I've got someone in front of me who's telling me they don't have enough time for me. Regardless of how valid, your, your reasons totally. might be totally valid. Doesn't change my needs. Doesn't change my reality. That's so true. And, and if your needs can't get met, then your job is to pivot and say, that's a real shame because I think we have a really good thing. I think, you know... I. God knows I would support you in your mission. I would absolutely want to be a great teammate. I don't want to distract you from what you're doing. I just want to be a part of your world and for you to be a part of mine. And I think we'd be really great together. And I think we'd actually be stronger as a team. But if you really feel that you don't have time for that and that you can't make that work, then I have to trust that that's true for you and go and find someone who it's not true for. And when you do yeah, that, when so you communicate true. like that, that, if anything, by the way, is going to make someone take pause, say that. it's that kind of communication. 100%. I think that's some, it's also puts you in such a more of an attractive light. Mm. 
right? Versus Instead of let like, me convince you why yeah, what you've just said isn't you true. Begging you basically to mm -hmm. like be with somebody, which leads me to my next thing, which is like, what do, because you do this for women mostly, like in your opinion, what are the top three things men really find the most attractive? Oh my God. You're a guy, but I'm not saying because you're a guy. You've talked to millions of guys. You know that, like, is it because people always do the easy thing, like, well, women like status and power, mm -hmm. and men like looks. Mm -hmm. But it's not. That's so basic. I think that. What um, do they really attract? The top three things that men are the most attracted to. I don't know about top three, but what immediately comes to mind is. Uh, acceptance if if you accept him that mm. won't be the first thing he says but it on an emotional level mm -hmm. that will be the, one of the things that resonates the most is if he can feel like he can drop the kind of bs act that he does the rest of the time and actually be him be him and reveal certain things about Maybe things that he's felt ashamed of or things that he's felt like if people knew that about me, they'd, they'd run a mile or if people, if he can express those things, I'm not saying if he can, you're justifying bad behavior, but if he can express those parts of himself that he thinks he won't be accepted for, and it could even just be his goofiness. It can be his, anything, like whatever. And you still fully accept him. That's a very, very powerful thing. And, and I, I would combine that actually with, really seeing him is what you have to really see someone before you can accept them so if you can echo back to that person who they are and even sometimes i think the little things that make them them mm -hmm. it, it, you know when you're able to point out something totally, that they do yeah. or a little ritual they have that means a lot to them and you don't judge them for it you just show that you know it and it you shows feel that like, you're also what, at paying attention exactly and and i love you for that and i think that's such a lovely part of you it you know it's and that maybe was a private ritual or something that not a lot of people know that they do or mm -hmm. care about or whatever that that is a very, very powerful thing to feel that seen and that accepted. So that would be my first one. Uh, another one would be having a real sense of your own value. Um, I think that I think that one of the big turnoffs for a lot of people, not in any one moment, but over time there can be an erosion of attraction if someone consistently puts themselves down and doesn't, you don't have to be the best looking person in the room, but if you're constantly pointing out that you are not, are not over time, that does start to erode attraction because instead of being able to just, you, people take their cues from us. Mm -hmm. If our cues tell someone that we're attractive, then that's an energy that they buy into. If we're constantly throwing out cues that we're not, eventually they, they might believe you. Totally, yes, I totally agree and, with you. And it's a really, it's the, there's, a, there's a real subtle line mm -hmm. between being vulnerable and just dumping on someone mm -hmm. your insecurities, the things that you're self-conscious about vulnerability is sharing some of the things that you feel self-conscious about, maybe even all of the things, but it's confidence or, or power is owning them and taking responsibility for them. And if we are constantly giving that stuff to our partner, almost like we're holding up a poster that says I'm shit mm -hmm. and <laughs> expecting them to say, no, you're not that, eventually that person will become exhausted mm -hmm. by that. And you don't, you, you want to walk around like it. I can't stress enough how important it is this idea that we tell people what to think about us by the way that we communicate about ourselves. The same is true of our past. We may have things from our past that we have historically seen as baggage. And, and people will normally bring that to me in the form of how do I talk about this thing? And I know when someone says, how do I talk about this thing? 
there's a sense of it's become this baggage. And right. what, how do I reveal the, How do I open this suitcase to them? Because I'm afraid that if I do, they're going to leave. But at a certain point in life, when we have made peace with certain things about our past, mistakes we've made, regrets we have, um, things we're not proud of or ashamed of, when we've made our peace with those things, we no longer convey them with the same emotion anymore. We, exactly true. We, yep. we convey them with a sense of neutrality. And when we convey it with a sense of neutrality, it's almost like it becomes just a car that went down the freeway in front of them and they don't really have, uh, you know, they don't even have the same time to stop and look at it because mm -hmm. they just go, oh, I, and maybe they would have, maybe even a part of them goes, oh, I am not sure about that thing. I don't know if I like what I just heard. But, but they also see that you've processed it and dealt with it and are at peace with it. And so if their reaction was going to be a nine out of 10 on disapproval, it drops to a five or a four, mm -hmm. and you can manage that. We, we give people those cues. The same, that's true of baggage. It's also true of our insecurities in the present. So I think anything someone can do to work on their own value so that they can give the right cues to the person they're with and not give them reasons not to like them all the time exactly is true. a really big deal. So what did, what did we have? Acceptance and being seen, um, uh, owning your own value. I forget how I put it the first time round, but owning your own value. And, and I think then a, a real sense of, hmm, some having things in your life that mean this person doesn't feel responsible for you and your happiness. They don't feel like by being in a relationship with you, they have a full time caring job, a full time right. carer job, I should say. They're not babysitting. They're not caregiver. Yeah, because that, you know, Esther Perel talks about it extensively the idea of love versus desire. Love, mm -hmm. both are necessary in a relationship. Love is the, the, coming together of two people uh, desire exists in the space between them yes and in the course of a relationship one of the struggles of maintaining desire is that if there's no more breathing room for that flame it becomes extinguished it gets suffocated so how do you maintain a, a healthy level of breathing room so that that fire can stay alive and and that's a that's a subtle dance in a, in any relationship but I think it's always worth asking ourselves, what are the things that I do that, uh, you know, Proust said the journey of discovery lies not in seeking new landscapes, but in seeing with new eyes. You, you can almost ask yourself the question, what have I done lately that allows my partner to see me with new eyes? Yeah. Am I doing, and, and that doesn't have to be anything. I'm not recommending people, you know, go take a journey to India for six months and <laughs> meditate on a hill. I'm just saying, you know, it might be a weekend away with your girlfriends. I think also it, it kind of what you're saying overall is like, have a full life. Like don't depend on someone else to provide you with everything, all your happiness, all your everything, like have a full life. Now where it comes kind of like tricky is then, and I think, in my mm. opinion, what I, I, I also like to observe and see, uh, a lot of men don't want to have the girls who are so put together in career success mm. because then, like, where do they fit in? So I think it becomes a, a, a new, it's very nuanced, <laughs> it right? Is, it really is, because you're right. It's, it's intimidating. Like, it's very intimidating. Yeah. And I think it's like becomes like who the guy is and what his story is because there are some guys who want to have you know, have the control. And, and, and that's why a lot of guys who are super successful, um, are with a bunch of dumbos. Like the girls are like, no, nothings and nobodies. They can't even string a sentence together. Like the, my most successful friends who are like rock stars and you meet their wife or their girlfriend. And you're like, you gotta be kidding me. Are you yeah. serious with this? Yeah. Because isn't that what you see? That isn't that like, that's it's realistically like all this can be said, like depends on who the guy is, what they're looking for, how really how insecure he is, how confident he really is and like true confidence. But that will depend. That's almost something you don't have to concern yourself with because those guys, the guys that you're talking about, everyone kind of gets 
I don't mean this in a, uh, in oh, a mean way, right. but kind you're of right. everyone gets what they deserve in that scenario. 100%. Because he, he gets someone that it's going to, he's sacrificing an enormous amount of connection with someone that can really hit the ball back. 100%. And she is kind of living in this world where she's sacrificing an enormous amount of freedom because if she grows and she becomes unmanageable what if she doesn't grow what if like a lot of these people no, but that's what yeah, i mean like yeah. they kind of they, they end up settling into a groove that both of them have made a sacrifice there i, I hear what you're saying he's sacrificing connection she's sacrificing becoming actualizing yeah self-actualizing right. and so that that those people find each other that's true that's a good point the if you're looking for if connection is really important to you then and, and truly feeling like the values you want in a person, you find them. You're not, you're not even looking. You're not. Your first point of call isn't going to be how successful someone is, or if you're a, a woman, let's say, or con how controllable someone is if you're a man. You're not looking for those things. You're looking for a partner. But is it psychological? Like, is it psychological to a point? Because I mean, guys do visually, visually, like they get attracted, and then that's the door opener. And then you have to, you know, and then you got to prove other things. Sure. I'm just, just from my own experiences. And for the girls, like you have a certain standard of who you want to be with. So that has to be the, the door opener. Right. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting that everyone is on the table. Yeah. But, you know, there are certain things that you may want. You may want someone who is attractive. You may want someone who is has a, a level of success where they are independent at where you can do things together and you're not carrying them all the time. You know, that that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but those standards get mutated very quickly Yeah. Uh, to yeah. the point where now someone has a certain thing that you're not, sh they don't come in this exact package that you thought you wanted. And all of a sudden you're going back to the drawing board and you're kind of in this obsessive kind of optimization that is really dangerous when it comes to finding love. That optimization hurts a lot of people. It leaves them alone because they can never find some, there's always going to be something that someone is missing or they don't quite look like this or they don't quite have that level. Oh, he's not quite six foot. Mm -hmm. oh, he's, like exactly. There's always, <laughs> there's always that thing. Um, there was a point I was going to make. Remind me how we got onto this. We were talking about what the three things that guys find most attractive, or was yeah, it? Are you, are you or were saying about don't you? Oh, you were saying about women intimidating men by having oh uh, lots yeah going on. I think that it, that happens also. I wanted to. I said that, um, and I I see this all the time with my my girlfriends who are single, like in their thirties and forties. And they can't, they're like beautiful and successful and they have everything going for them mm -hmm. and they cannot find a guy to save their life. They can't get arrested. Never mind. Like they can't find anybody. And you, then you have like, and it's not, I don't know if it's, it's a lack of people or like guys I feel like don't really want sometimes that equal partner. That's what I was saying. There is a school of thought that, um, any, any situation where a guy earns less money than a woman or is less successful mm -hmm. than her is sort of doomed. Uh, right. I don't, I don't subscribe to that, but you have to hear these things and go, what's the, where's the seed of truth here? Instead of just dismissing it, what's, why are people saying that? And I believe that people say that because it's typical for Firstly, there's always going to be, in, in that example, there's always going to be a portion of men who are intimidated no matter what. And yeah. it's insurmountable. You're not going to get over it because they cannot do the work on themselves to get to a point where they're comfortable with a successful woman. So, But we're not worried about that group of guys. There's another, That's I would true. argue, bigger group of guys who are, they are just trying to figure out what they're needed for, <laughs> where their value is, where their significance comes from, like we all are in life. We're right, right. trying to feel, we want to feel needed. We want to feel like we matter. And, and we're worried that, you know, on a date, if this person has it all figured out, 
I don't, I, I might have that slight, it doesn't necessarily make me a bad person, it doesn't necessarily make me a misogynist. I just might not know where I fit in. Like, where, can I be needed here? Can I get what? that feeling that I'm looking for? Can I say something? Yeah. I think what it is, not, <laughs> I feel like what it is, is that, by the way, if I wasn't doing this, I would do what you do. I love what, I love all this stuff so much. I feel like guys want to feel like a man. And right. I think that's come at the core of everything. If they don't feel like a man, it's hard for them to be in a relationship because they need to feel, you know, I'm not saying you're going to constantly like, you know, base, you're amazing. You're amazing. I'm saying like, make them feel like a man. It makes them want to be around you more and wants to be, be with you. And mm -hmm. I think when some of these women who are very type A and very put together, it makes the guy feel very emasculated. That would be my opinion. You You're the to, expert. No, 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 no. I think you, you make a very valid point. I don't think all men are like that, but I think that if, if you're taking, if you're talking patterns in men, a very, 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 very common pattern is Isn't men who want to feel like a man. And by the way, they've been brought up to to believe that that's their value. They, in many times, right. by mothers, not just by fathers, True. by mothers who have taught them that their value is their ability to provide, to protect, and be that masculine figure. And so they've not been equipped with any of the things that they might need to feel valuable in a context where yeah. they don't feel like a man. So True. that's a, that's not easy for people in that. It doesn't make them bad people. It just makes them no. people who do not, they don't know how to figure out their way around that. So I look at that and I, I think what's, how in the same way, let's take it because gender often charges things let's just take a gender out of it and say in a situation where someone in a f school reunion goes back and they've made a ton of money they've made millions of dollars and everyone knows it in that room what would be a great way to go into that room if you really wanted to connect with people and you were a good person who also wanted to make other people feel significant. And by the way, you're also the kind of person whose own values are in the right place. Right. And so you don't think you're better than everyone in that room because you've made a load of money. How would you go into that room? You would go in curious about the other people, wanting to know about their lives, wanting to know about their families, about their kids, about what they love doing, about the movies they've watched that they love, about True. What's, what for them feels like life well lived now. And you'd want to share those same things from your side. I'm not talking about hiding what you've done. I'm talking about actually connecting with those people on a human level. I, the idea that on a date, someone comes out knowing all of your achievements is bizarre to me. That's so true. Why do they know? Why? Why? I, every time, every time I come off a date, people are intimidated by my success. Why do they know about your <laughs> totally success? True. Like, what, they did, lead I, with did it. I walk into this it's room? So when true. you and I met today, did I walk in and go? So I have the number one YouTube channel in the world. I have a New York Times bestselling book. I have this. I have that. That that's not no. a, that's not a conversation. I to you're like you are preach preach. But you're so. Right. And that's what happens a lot of times, 100%, because you know why they lean on that? Because that's what they've, that's what makes them feel like they are worthy. That's what people do. Well, it's the, it's the weapon they feel comfortable. The wielding. weapon. And it's the, your, your, your weapon becomes, you, Christopher Hitchens uh, once said the, you, the trick in relationships is not allowing your advantages to negate themselves. Yeah. And it's a very, very so powerful true. idea because whatever is the thing that you're comfortable wielding because you think that's your power, you think that's your value, you're probably going to overuse it. And it becomes to your detriment. When we go on a date, we forget that my job is to connect with this person. And if I keep, the, I'm, again, there are always going to be some people that are intimidated you, by you no matter what. And there are, people that are misogynists and all blah, blah, blah. But there's also a ton of people that they're looking for a way to connect and feel like they matter. And if you go into a date 
instead of thinking, can they handle me? <laughs> you think, <laughs> so how true. do I make this person feel like they matter? How do I, how do I, you know what's um, a, a guy, a writer I know, uh, what's his Kevin name? Conley. Yeah, yes. He said to me, um, he used to interview people for, I don't know if it was the Hollywood Reporter or, but he used to write columns on very well-known people. But he didn't, a lot of them he didn't even know. So it's not like he went in being awestruck by these people. Right, he, right. In a lot of cases, it became so run of the mill to him that it was a kind of like right, exercise in trying to figure out how to care. <laughs> and he would say to me, the thing that would really make an article when he wrote a piece about these people was him going into the interview with the challenge to himself, can I get to a place in this interview where I actually feel grateful to have sat with this person? And his line of questioning would always be trying to lead him to that place of gratitude. How could I feel grateful for being in this person's presence? And if he could come away from a conversation feeling like he learned something, feeling like he had an admiration for something they had overcome, feeling like there was something about them that was unique or interesting, and he therefore felt grateful for the time, mm -hmm. by the time it finished, he said that would always translate into an interesting article. Imagine we took that approach to a date. Instead of going in going, how do I, you know, overshadow, how do I trump this person with my achievements? How do I show how great I am? How do I impress? What if we went in from a place of, you know, how, how could I achieve a moment of gratitude that I was with this person? Because if you can achieve that, you probably made them feel special mm -hmm. in the process. 100% true. That's a very good point. This is why I love your perspective. You're very, you're very good at this whole Thank coaching you. thing. I have one more thing to ask you. What are the two most common things that people ask you? Most common questions. Like not people <laughs> like, I mean like yeah. who you know, DM you or in your love club. Is that what it's called? I think it would be the Love Life Club. Love Life yeah. Club, okay. Love I, Club. It sounds like a like a swinger club. <laughs> yeah. There's a different you'll yeah. be trying to get me to create <laughs> yeah. that next. Yes, exactly. Um, That's the kind of app I was talking about. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What do people ask me? Um I suppose there's most so many questions revolve around either how to find love, how, you know, what do I do? Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not meeting the people that I want to meet. I feel like the people I'm attracted to are never attracted to me. You know, I feel like I never meet anyone that I really like. Mm -hmm. um, it's so hard where I live. Those are all variations on how to find love. And what do you tell them? And in a very brief way, what do you say? Like if they can't find love, where to find that? Like, what do you say? I think there's Go a, to hinge? Like, what do you say? Whole, no, I, I think there's a whole kind of, and, and it, this, isn't, this isn't actually a lot of as much work as it sounds, but there's almost like a portfolio of things that you can do mm. that if you tick those boxes, I believe it becomes close to inevitable that you will meet someone. And those are, that's literally, the Love Life Club is designed to give people that roadmap and show people what does it actually look like to be proactive in I, I, I talk about it as this is, I'm going to show you the approach to finding love for people who are exhausted by trying to find love. <laughs> really? Right? So that's what your Love Life Club does? It's, yeah, it's about showing people that you're, you want to find love, but you're sick of dating. I'm going to show you a holistic approach to getting your love life to where you want it to be and learning to love your life in the process even before it happens. Uh, because I really believe that the battle is won while you're still single. Yeah. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect before you meet someone, but the so much of the work you can do, mm -hmm. you can do now. And if you have the right strategies in place, it will happen. The other set of questions I get usually revolve around closure of some kind. Why mm. didn't they call? Why did he fade away you know mm -hmm. why do you give me the slow fade yeah <laughs> um why did he come on really strong and then all of a sudden uh disappear why did do, does he 
keep calling and wanting to see me and wanting to do things and wanting to do trips even though he doesn't want to commit um why did they why did they ghost me it's so much of it revolves around i want answers i right. want to understand what happened and whether there's anything i can do about it and what's the main what's the main answer you give to all those variations of the second question well i think there's answers to do with them there's answers to do with us i think oftentimes the answer to do with them is falls into that category mm -hmm. of you don't need to f spend time understanding them. Right. All you're doing there is trying to spend more time in understanding the wrong person. And you're then making that the wrong people, your entire field of vision. Yes. You need to pivot to the people that are the, you know, the example of the race car driver in the post. Yes. You know, they, yes. they teach them to steer away, look, look away from the post. Cause yep. if you look at the post, even though you think you're steering away from it, you're going to drive right into it. Exactly. That's what it's like when you over-focus on the wrong person. It's like you, you wonder why you keep hitting the post. It's because that's where you're dedicating your time and energy. The reasons to do with us, and again, I have a whole masterclass that I do on this in the, the Love Life Club, is the we often, like we talked about earlier, we often have mutated in a certain area of strength mm -hmm. and we don't realize that when someone says we're to this on one of my q a yeah. call today with the love life club someone said men keep saying i'm too optimistic which is an interesting thing right? oh you really that's an attractive should... quality but yeah. when i hear that i don't hear you're too optimistic i hear you're not enough of something else there is something else that is actually the reason why people are fading out when you're trying to build attraction with them. It's not your optimism. That's not the problem. It's that your optimism would be would go great when paired with flirtation, when paired yeah. with a sense of just vulnerability instead of like someone giving you their problem and you go, well, here's what you should do. Yeah. You know, instead if you just listened and related and shared something, that would pair really well with that. Optimism pairs really well with playfulness or a little teasing. Mm -hmm. You know, like these things become what I call unique pairings. And unique pairings are what make us irresistible. One great quality won't make you irresistible. It will get someone's attention, but it won't make you irresistible. When you pair something that's great with another unexpected thing that's great that you wouldn't normally find those two things in the same person that's when you become that's irresistible. A, that's a great, give me, give me a couple more pairings and then you can go home. It would be, I mean, this is a silly one, but like you have great sex with someone and then you realize that they're really fun to hang out with for two hours afterwards eating pizza and watching a show. Okay, you but know, that's a great pairing. Because you yes. realize like, oh, this isn't just someone I had fun with sexually. This is someone I love hanging out yeah. with. That's a unique pairing a unique pairing is you you know you have this playful confidence about you that's really cheeky when we're together but when we go and see my family you're an absolute gentleman like there's you're so caring and you're so kind to the right. people right so like kind I of love. like opposite like op yeah, they're, they're, they're things that often you don't find in the same they don't always have to be opposites but the the thing that tends to make them unique is that it's hard to find both of those things in the same person. Gotcha. And if, and by the way, like if you ever want to know why you struggled so hard to get over an ex, it's usually because they had a unique pairing that you didn't think you'd find again. That's so true. I agree with you. And you can create unique pairings and that's, what's really empowering about this. How you can invest in yourself. You're not going home to, I got so many <laughs> poor guy. We'll cut, we'll do another one, okay. but you can, you can invest in yourself in ways that, build unique pairings and build how irresistible and attractive you are out there in the world. That is true in business. That is true in love is true in, in friendships is true in every part of life. And that, that to me is one of the great, like when you know that your life becomes a really fun exercise. That's such a good thing to end with a unique pairing. That's great. I agree with that a hundred percent, but I don't know how you can really, you know, 
I, I think you're right. If I think back, it's always people had this like, I'm never going to find this because it's the... so true. We'll do this again sometime. When? When, are we, when are you coming back? Tomorrow? When are you... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Now but I... you're great. You're great. And, and you gave me a, a lovely compliment in, in saying I was great at what I do. You're great at what you do because, and I Thank see, you. I see you when you say like, if I wasn't doing this, I'd do what you're doing. You're very good at it. And you, you're very, your mind puts things together very, very quickly and it's Thank clear you. to me why you do what you do. You know, you elicit incredible conversation and incredible information. So uh, I appre- that's yeah. so nice. I really appreciate you saying that. I actually am so fascinated by human nature and human behavior, and I'm always watching and observing. So that's why someone like you on this podcast who does this, like I'm like so interested in this stuff, right? Because people, you know, in my world, come to me for all. I, I'm like I had a whole. Um, and I had a whole uh, breast cancer charity and I had an auction every year. It was very well known in L.A. and where it was basically a bachelor auction. And I would auction off eligible men and all the money we would raise, we would give to breast cancer. And it was because like I was the person that would always be giving people relationship and coaching advice. I love it. I love all of this. So it was a, such a pleasure to have you on this podcast. You're, you. And I see why you, you have the number one YouTube channel. I see why that you're so like, like you are so likable and you're so relatable. I, 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 you need to have an app and you need to have all these other <laughs> businesses. I'm, I'm just kidding, but you are amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And so wh- how do people, okay, go to YouTube because it, he's got amazing videos, obviously Instagram, you're on TikTok, right? I mean, I'm on TikTok. Where would be the best? What, what do you think? Join love life? Oh no! I, I tell you where there's a there's a, a great thing people can do um, on the website. If people go to yourdatingsolution.com, mm-hmm. it will just give you like a quick multiple choice quiz, and you can answer it based on your dating oh, challenge great. or your relationship challenge right now. So whatever you're going through, you'll find the answer that matches that. And it will recommend you the best one of my solutions for what you're dealing with right now. It's kind of a neat little tool we have right now. Oh, that's so great. It's over at yourdatingsolution.com. That's, and are you writing any books? What's next for you? I'm writing something right now. Um, it will land uh, next year. Oh. And... Um, but I would love to, uh, yeah. No, you're so going to, you're going to come back before you have to come back before then, <laughs> please. I like, this was like, I, I loved having you and thank you very much to you guys for being so patient. I don't know how long this was, but how long was this? Over two hours. Oh, that's not that bad. It's not Mark Manson or, or like any, well, maybe it was, how long was it? Two and a half hours? Okay. That's not terrible. It was great. Two hours is not yeah. bad. That's like a normal-ish amount. I'm excited to see the, the audience's reaction. Uh, they're going to love you. There's no way. I mean, this, like, your stuff really does not, I mean, not, you. people like love this stuff. Like, I don't care if people come in for business, success tips, whatever. This, to me, is like an area that everyone relates to. Yeah. And that's why I never believe when people say, oh, it doesn't matter. Love to, it, that's the whole thing. Like, I think it's baloney when they say that shit. And it's so transferable. You can take all of this and apply. You could listen totally. to all of this in the context of business, and I guarantee you it all still makes perfect sense. Well, I also feel like if you're not ha- happy in this area of your life, you're, it's going to really affect you in other areas. 100%. I think you have to have a balance of, and also whatever. So also not just business, it's about habits and productivity.